picking of the twelve, right? The Jesus, from the greater disciples, which is the one key piece hidden in the scripture, that there was a lot of people involved, that Jesus, from the, from the disciples, picks twelve, right? And why does he pick twelve? Because they represent the new age, the new nucleus, the new nucleus of the twelve tribes, right? The connection between the old law and the old Abrahamic covenant in the new covenant, the twelve are chosen out of the disciples, set apart. And where disciples, a disciple means follower, an apostle means a deliverer of the gospel, right? So they're given a specific role. That's actually one of the most important links that Luke gives us in the picking the twelve, because at the very beginning of Acts, what happens at the beginning of Acts? Can anyone remember? Which is Luke's work too. What happens at the beginning of Acts? Sorry? Yes, but that's Acts 2. What happens in Acts 1? He ascends. He does. But what do the apostles do? What do the apostles do in Acts 1? Is that when they're gathering? They are gathered. Correct. But they do something first in Acts 1. They replace Judas. With Matthias. They replace Judas with Matthias. They make the twelve complete. Correct? They don't enter the new age with the Holy Spirit as eleven. They enter as twelve. And that's a really important link to Luke's word here. Yes? The twelve is a symbolic representation of the nucleus of the new. The new age, the twelve apostles, the twelve tribes. The link between the Abrahamic covenant and the covenant that is given at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Alright? Good. <coughs> so, we'll now get into, we'll now get into what is, uh, it's the wrong word to use here, because really it's the Beatitudes, but in reality the Beatitudes is Matthew's work. This is often described as the Sermon on the Plain, right? And it's Acts, it's, um, sorry, it's Luke chapter 6 verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came to, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. Questions, observations? I love it. Right. What? Level place, meaning that he was with them. He was, he was a part of where they were and you know, where they were. Yeah. If you look at 12, he's come down from the mountain, right? He's been praying. So clearly, he now comes on to a place where he can address the crowd. And I do. I like that. So he, he stood on a level place, as in he wanted to be able to speak directly to those, the people who are here. What else do we get from this opening prologue of the Beatitudes? Well, they all uh, needed to be healed. Yeah, so I agree with you, Jack. They all needed to be healed, right? You've got still got a great multitude of people who are coming. Now, there's a darker side to that. What is that? There's a darker side to what Luke's telling you. Get it? No? They, they, I mean, he, there wasn't any hope. I mean, they didn't have any. They yes, yes. Yeah. They were sick and they were healed. He also talks about the unclean spirits. And what else do we get from this piece of scripture? I was just thinking that they had ulterior motives for being there to come to hear, but to be healed. Good. Absolutely. That's what we get. They still have their own agenda to this. They still are coming with an agenda. Now, is the agenda important? Yes. This man's reputation is massive. The crowd is very big. And you get from Judea and Jerusalem and, and the, the seacoast, what's Luke telling you in this particular narrative? That people were coming from far and wide. That now, this, that Jesus' reputation was really significant, right? Now, don't, as readers, we know the end story. I keep saying that all the time. We know what's going on here. So what you've got to get from the narrative that Luke's telling us is he's telling you a reason why all these people come from the greater area. Why? Because now he's in his ministry. And not only did his ministry wake up the people of the area, they also woke up the authorities of the area too. Yes? 
So he's got all these people there looking at him, watching him, but they still come with their own agenda. They come to be healed, okay? Now you'll notice that he talks about those wanting to be healed, but actually there is no, the Luke gives you a very different use of the word when it comes to taking the demons away. It's like the demons are dealt with because of the nature of the demons rather than the people wanting to be healed. Does that make sense? That there's a distinction between the two. That the demons would have been dealt with. The demons potentially don't want to be there. They happen to come as well because we get this from Mark, Matthew and Luke that even the demons know his name, right? And maybe they're there because they can't help being there but they're driven away. Whereas there's an agenda for those who are sick to be healed. There's a magical notion about what Jesus is saying here. What, what you're being told by Luke is there's a magic of it. There's a power came out from him and healed them all. Now, now, we know from Mark, Matthew, and Acts that you can be healed just by touch, right? But Luke doesn't give us that. Luke, in chapter 8, only gives us that what actually heals by touching Jesus, Jesus, Jesus himself? No. Luke says something distinctly different in the other two Gospels in chapter 8, that he brings back to this power here. He says that actually the touch is won by faith, the woman, right? That it's won by faith that she has. Whereas there's two distinctive areas that you can be touched. Jesus will heal based on just his power, but also based on your faith. And you're getting that in Luke in this opening piece. And really what we get from this piece is that clearly now you have this magnificent teacher who has got a large gathering of people who picks 12 people to be really close to him. And he has something about him, an aura, a power. Something is radiating from him that cannot be mistaken, unmistakably glory, right? And that, in these hidden pieces, is what Luke is telling you, is that when Jesus stood on that plane in front of everybody, he was different. He looked different. He said things that were different. Why is he saying this in the prologue? Because what we're about to get is what is different in the Beatitudes, all right? Anything else? I'll tell, I'll tell you all out of practice. <laughs> Anything else? Any questions? Right, so, in the Beatitudes, Luke breaks them down into four... No, he doesn't. I break them down into four distinctive categories, okay? Which is really what you look at. What is a Beatitude? Blessings. blessings. So, blessings... Blessings is a big word here. Blessings would have meant something very distinctive to the Jews. A blessing upon your house. A blessing upon your head, a blessing upon your family, spoken by every Jewish family every Sabbath Eve. As they, have, they sing this blessing on your family, blessing on our children, blessing on each other. Blessing was a big one. And it, pro it professed something, Jesus uses the word cleverly, because it professes something about a desire and a delight that they would have had. We all like our blessings. Even today we see the same thing. Oh, I'm really blessed. Oh, I've had such a blessing upon my life. Oh, I'm really blessed, okay? It's, uh, there's no hidden, there's no hiddenness here. This is just a clear use of word, a clever use of word. And Jesus wants us to understand that the blessings are real. But of course, as you know from the Beatitudes, there's a positive and then there's a negative. Yes, but they still marry together as a blessing. And that's what we have to learn. And there are four distinctive ones he talks about. He has the blessed, the first section, uh, the first section, verses 20 through 26, is our circumstances. The second section, verse 27 through 38, is people. Verse 29 through 38, I think. No, 43 is self. And then verse 44 through 49 is God. So when you look at the Beatitudes, what you distinctly get is our view. And you can even put in the word our heart view. Our heart view 
are of what Jesus is saying. That you break them into the circ- your, how you look at circumstances, how you look at people, how you look at yourself, and how you look at God. And what he's done is he links all this in the blessings, the overall blessing of the Beatitudes, right? That if you look at how you're blessed, all of this changes. Many people have confused that the Beatitudes is a new constitution, that Jesus actually sets a constitution of the Christian life. No, not at all, not at all. It's not what he's doing. He's almost bringing a correction back to how you are to live, but he's doing it to the Jews. Don't forget that. This is still a message to the Jews. He's still talking to Jewish people. He's still talking about their life as a Jew and what they see in life as a Jew, still holding on to what they've got in the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, and the law. And he's going to correct that by saying, actually, it is how we look at what's in our heart that changes our relationship with God and what he says in the Beatitudes. So let's look at them. Any questions? Any observations? This is this is such a huge change, and you're talking about Abraham, Moses, going going back in the past. The Jews saw so many things that God did, but He did them through a leader like Abraham or Moses or somebody else. But here, this is totally different. This is God himself and his son. It's just a it's just a, so totally different yeah. from before. Yeah. This is the son. And th- there is a certain sense of authority that is there's there's a struggle for those listening, which is why we get the issue of the healed there's still a desire for them to deal with their own agenda. The Moses agenda is freedom from slavery, right? And even then, they give him a hard time. You know, have you really brought us out of slavery for us to die at the Sea of the Red Sea? Could we not have been buried back there? And that continues throughout Moses' career, for want of a better word. The, 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 the spies come back and absolutely take out, convince the entire people against Moses that this land is not for us, right? So you get that. The same thing happens then with the prophets. The same thing happens with the kings. The same thing happens that ultimately the people as a whole are never quite satisfied, right? And Jesus as a leader is going through the same thing. And in the Beatitudes, he says that. He says, be warned, like your fathers rejected the prophets, you're going to find people who are doing the same thing. We are living a rejection of Christ and his values today. So let's not give the Jews a hard time. Because we as Gentiles are really going through a stage in our history where actually more and more people are finding it easier to stand on the bandwagon of secular secular humanism. Rather than Christian values. Mm -hmm. You try turning around to 17 and 18 year olds now and say, Oh, by the way, when you become the head of your family, young men, right? You are to love your wife and she is to submit and respect to you. You'd have a riot on your hands. Mm -hmm. Sorry to use that word, but it's true. Right? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, we see it from a secular humanist view instead of the view of what God actually intends. And what God intends is what Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes now. He talks about changing your heart structure rather than what you understand to be something you can do. He talks about your attitude that changes and your heart changes. <coughs> All right, 20 through 26. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Oh, that's a big one. He's not talking to the bigger crowd here, he's talking to the disciples. Now, can the crowd hear him? Of course, absolutely. He's on an area where they can't hear him. But there's a reason why Luke has put this in. Luke had just said, and he began to speak. He doesn't. He's in deep thought. He prepares himself, probably prayer and meditation, and looks upon his disciples as if to give them a charge, to give them something different. Why? Why does he do that? He wants to give warn the disciples to know it. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, say that again, James, so I can repeat it. He wants, his, he wants those that aren't his disciples 
to recognize it as well. He wants his disciples to know their suffering. Yes, he does. Yes, yes, yes. He's really pointing out, he wants his disciples to know they're separated. He does. As in, the agenda of those who have come because they want to be healed, right? I'm not saying that they didn't become disciples. Of course they may have done. But in this particular piece, Luke is saying there's a distinctive difference between A, the apostles, B, the disciples, and C, the crowd. Right? There is a distinctive difference. Yes, ma'am. Their motivation, before he even picked them, you could tell they were always searching for the Christ. Correct. They had been wanting Correct. Very to good. find the Christ. So they were. They have yeah. always been searching. And there are three levels of that search. Right. Or he picks a greater level, or in terms of responsibility, of what will happen to them as well. And many of those disciples may have suddenly walked away at, at Calvary. Many, many walked away not understanding until Pentecost. We know that. Well, it's not fair to state they wouldn't because the apostles did the same thing. The apostles scattered in fear, right? So he's making a distinctive difference between the three. And he says that when he talks about hunger. He says that when he talks about weeping. He, he makes it as if to say there's a spiritual and a literal na- notion of what I'm going to tell you. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who are weak now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Questions, observations. No. We're not blessed when we're poor. And secular humanism will tell you that every day, 24-7, in so many different ways. But when you submit that human element, that part of yourself, and the understanding that, no, there really is blessing in, in being poor in spirit, and even in, in letting go of the idea of riches, of really understanding poverty for what it, what it is, is that it's, there are tons of people that are that are considered in poverty that have that are actually very very happy and very content, and so I mean it's just it's it is a freedom from that humanism that's in us that just wants to conquer. I guess it's from it's way back from the garden. I mean it's, it's there is and this link back to the garden is nice. So I mean, just to, just to, so what Andrew is saying is is that. There's still a notion within our secular humanist world where we see blessing as a positive thing. We see blessing as something that we want and desire from how the world sees it rather than how God sees it. And God, Jesus, turns this and says, okay, blessing now on those of you who are poor. And he's talking about poor, literally, and he's talking about spirit, literally. He's talking about poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, right? Blessed are you who are poor greatly. In a literal sense, he's talking to disciples and saying, guess what? My name is not going to make you rich. And if it does make you rich, it's wrong. It's false. And he warns that through the rest of his ministry. Yes, Jeremy? I, I like how he, he doesn't minimize what they're feeling or what they feel or what their, their plight is. He says, you are hungry, but you shall be. He doesn't say... You're not really hungry. It's not as bad as you think it is. But he just says, yeah, you're hungry. I see it. But you will be. Yeah. You know, you will have ownership of the kingdom. You will be fulfilled. You will be happy. And you will, you will be with people who don't make fun of you anymore. That is correct. Our time. And that's it. Yeah, he does. So, you know, he, we don't have enough. He really makes a point of where you are, not where you could be. Right. But because where you are, there is a consequence or an action to where you are. And it is this. You are hungry, you will be fed. You are poor, you will be rich. But it's that essence of the blessing that becomes key. Because it isn't richness based on your desire, it's richness based on your relationship with God. It isn't hungry because you need food, man does not live on bread alone, it's hungry because you desire to be satisfied. Right? And we look at that hunger as satisfaction. You desire to be satisfied. So spiritually, you will be satisfied. Hung poor, you will be rich. And all of this is really clever in terms of what Jesus is saying to the crowd. 
And then, a fi his final piece in, this, in the Beatitude here at 22, is he get, he's distinctly talking to the disciples and the, and the apostles. He's actually saying, what happened to the, the, to the prophets is going to happen to you. That ultimately, ultimately, I will be rejected. Oh, guess what? When you read the Beatitudes, he's no longer just talking to the apostles and the disciples. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. What he's saying now is, is what we read from this application is, is that if you're prepared to stand up as a Christian, gosh, especially today, you will be rejected. You will be seen as evil. You will. And it's such a difficult concept to really grasp. How can someone see a Christian as evil? Yes, secular humanism sees you as evil. You are the cause of all the problems in the world. You are the cause of war. You are the cause of strife. You are the cause of every single problem that befalls human nature today is because of religion and belief in this God. This mythical story that came out of the Middle East 2,000 years ago that has completely destroyed the planet as it is today. That's, that's, that's reality. Turn the TV on and look at it. Turn the TV on and tell me this is not a secular view. This is a religious view because it absolutely is. Right? So actually what Jesus is saying to this group, to you here is, is that there again is going to come a choice in terms of your heart. In terms of your heart view. Are you prepared to stand up and be a Christian and accept to be considered to be evil? Because if you are, there will be riches in that acceptance. There will be riches in the stance that you take. Right? <laughs> Where are we? 24. Now you have the alternative. Now Jesus then turns it around on the alternative. Now be careful, because what he is not saying is that it's wrong to be rich. That's been a poor interpretation of this scripture. Right? He's not saying that. He now says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Questions, observations. Don't miss this. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. The statement I see here in my study Bible is woe to the self satisfier satisfaction that we don't come to ourselves. Absolutely. So, what your study Bible is right. The woe is to your self-desire, okay? Now, this is not self-care in terms of your view. It's your desire of the circumstances. To do what? To do those things yourself. Yes. So, actually, the woe is to the bettering of your circumstances at the cost of all else. Of the riches of the bettering of your circumstances at the cost of all else. Of the hunger of making sure you are satisfied at the cost of all health else. The fact you'll be happy rather than woeful at the cost of all else. Else, That's what he's saying here. He's not saying it's wrong, it's, it's wrong to be rich. He's saying it's wrong to desire richness in order to improve your circumstances. Because his warning is, is that when you do that, what's the first thing you do? You throw God away. You forget him. You do. It absolutely is the case. You put yourself first because you can do this. I can do this. I can build myself better than this. I can achieve this. We can get to this point. I can get to this point. And Jesus says, woe to you with that attitude. Woe to you with that heart attitude of circumstances. <coughs> because ultimately, it's putting God in the circumstance that changes the desire. God will give you the richness. God will give you the, the food. God will give you the happiness. And God will give you the joy. He will. He will. And the humanist second of view is to turn around and go, yeah, maybe. Right? And what is that word maybe? Yeah. It's doubt. And the doubt comes from one of them. Uh, you talk about going back to the garden. The doubt comes right back to the garden when Eve turns around and in that moment she listens to the devil who says, he surely will not kill you. And at that moment, everything changed. That moment, everything changed. Right? Because the minute the doubt comes in to that point, you then put self first. And that's simply what Jesus is saying. He's say and oh my gosh, this is so much easier to say than do. Right? So much easier to say than do. It's ownership. It is. It's what, do you, who owns it? And do you think that you own it or do you know 
that the Lord owns it. Mm-hmm. And that's the riches and that's the joy and that's all of it. I mean, what, when you have it, it's still not yours. And that's what we've got to focus on. When you have it, it is not yours. And you have to focus on that it isn't yours. Because what's the thing? What's the actual thing? Jeremy, hold on. Hold on. What is the actual issue mentally for us human idiots? What is the mental issue with ownership? If you have it, it's not yours. Good. But where do we go in our dark doubt moments at that point? Where do we go? We go to, to, to hoarding that, to owning that. To Why? Because of fear. Because fear of what? Losing. Yes! Okay. Oh! I didn't hear what you said. That's exactly, yeah. that's exactly what it. What did you say? I didn't hear what you said. Losing it. Oh, yeah, losing it. Yeah. Yeah. That is exactly the problem. That is exactly it. Because actually, you know how health and wealth works? Because there's no health and wealth preacher going to tell you you'll lose it. We like that section of the story. We like that section of the message. We enjoy the fact that we get the blessings and we, and we don't have to worry about it. And you know something? When you really preach health and wealth, you stop with the woes. You don't do the alternative. Because the blessings are the ones that keep... You're going to be poor, you'll be fed. You'll be well, rich. You'll be fed, hungry, you'll be fed. And no one talks about the woes because Jesus did talk about the woes. And he said, if you put yourself first and you desire these things for yourself, then woe to you. Right. What do they do with the story of Job? So actually, the real key piece here that we go to as humanists is our fear is of losing the blessing. And we tend to focus on that in itself, which is problematic. Jeremy, you had your hand up. Very similar to what you talked about. I was going to touch on the fact that the woes are, people think that they've already completed it, that, they're, that they've succeeded. I think what he's saying is because you have this, you have not succeeded. It's quite the opposite. Fail. Correct, yeah. Because your goal is wrong. That's right. He's talking about the goal. Your principle, your foundation for why you need to be rich is wrong. Your foundation to these people. Not yes. He's them. saying, so you're absolutely right. He's saying that your foundation is wrong, that your desire and want is wrong. It comes from a poor place. Right. And he uses words. He uses, he doesn't use a dramatically aggressive word. He uses a disappointing, sullen, and heavy word in the word woe. Right, which is a really clever use of the word. Unfortunate. You, Whoa. Yeah, Whoa. it is. Whoa. There is a, an, a there's an unfortunate they're nature they're to wrong. it. You're absolutely they're not, right. They're not punished. It's Whoa. It, it, it shows his loving nature. It does. Very good. Because in contrast, in contrast, John the Baptist opened his dialogue in verse three with "You brood of vipers." Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. But he comes from a very different perspective. He's almost being spitting aggressiveness, whereas Jesus is being, I really want you to think this through and change. John said, you brood of vipers, repent. Jesus says, woe that your heart is in the wrong place. Yeah? Good. All right, let's get on to people. Verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And for one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Either, give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Questions, observations? We're going to have my Bible, Mark, also in 38, that word guilt. That word give is a huge word. It has multiple meanings. Guilt. You know, give your time, your talent, give what you can, just as in Jabez and Chronicles, ask God to bless him in our just coast. I mean that's a great illustration about bless me, Lord. And that comes to that blessing. you know, and that does when we talk about self, yes. that does become key. When you talk about people, and they are linked, I do agree with you that he's talking about the link between self and people, but he links that at the end by saying, do unto others as you would have done to you. That's the link between those two sections of his narrative, right? So the give is good, it is right, but it isn't before this piece here. 
you've got to understand how you view this piece here to really understand the give based on yourself. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Any questions, observations on people, 27? I think that human nature makes us think that loving and praying people is a feeling. But when I read it here, it's a commandment. And when you think about that, it's not a choice. It's we are commanded to love and pray for all people. Yeah, we are to love and to pray for all people. Absolutely right. And it, this is what there's a this love your enemies is a key one because that's not law. That's not that's there's this such strong Deuteronomical Leviticus structures, number structures of law when it comes to how people can harm you, right? There, and there is. And Jesus is almost turning this on itself. He's turning on this idea that actually that isn't the case. You you are. And I'm glad I got this opportunity because I couldn't do this online. But there is this essence here of. Okay? In creation. That actually, love your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. Love one another with yourself. But the, the three is a link, it's a circle link. A hor vertical line to God, a horizontal line to each other. But actually, that's the basis of the great commandment. It all structures here, right? God created Adam, God created Eve. We are to love ourselves, each other as ourselves, but also in the greatness of loving God at the same time. And Jesus brings us right down here to Andrew's point that actually he goes through very, he turns around and says, everything you see is being bad to you, turn it on its head. Because that's the freedom. Right. And, yeah. And I agree, I like that. Oh, that is the freedom. That is the freedom. I'm going to be a little bit careful with it though, because I think actually it's something the secular humanists have jumped on. It's not freedom so that you understand this, it's freedom so that you feel better. Would you agree? Well, yeah. we, we get this. I, I'm saying from yeah. a Christian perspective, we get this because it's a directive, right? And we know what the directive means in our lives. But they're not getting freedom from love, <coughs> they're getting freedom from hate. They are. That, that they is, are. Yeah. Get, you're absolutely right, they're getting free from hate, not love. I agree. Right. And actually, we're, what you've got the people to and say, you've got to let it go, and you don't hold on to it because you can feel better, or you can't change the way they are, you can just change the way you feel about it. Right? Yeah. But God doesn't say that. He says, not only do you forgive them, you pray for them as well. And that's really easy to pray for the armies over there. Someplace for the people out there who are doing badly, but when someone approaches you personally and attacks you personally, that's where the work is the wheel, really, because oh, yes. then you are called to stand before others around you. How am I going to respond to this? Yeah. You know, this person caused me intentionally, made me to intentionally lose my job. How then do I respond? Yes, you're absolutely God right. Me to pray for them, but I don't want to, but the Holy Spirit within you, if you ask. And it's got nothing to do with you. And so you're right. It's so much more difficult to really take a personal sin, a personal effect upon you, and take the stance that Jesus is saying. It's so much more difficult. It's so much more difficult to break apart and, and, and pray for that person, to really spend time to think about what that person is doing. Because here's the warning, and I will give you this warning many times. I'll give you this warning several times. When you pray in these circumstances, you tend to pray based on you. You tend to pray based on how this person's affected you. Like, and that's not what that's not what God is saying here. The pray comes at the end of it. He says, if they curse you, bless them. That you forgive, bless, pray. Forgive, bless, pray. Right? And and the same thing, this whole view of the people comes from that actually, and it does come back to the give, is that you must take you out of it and put that person first and, and when that person has done nothing but attack you that's one of the hardest things you can do in life and doing that god will then use that to show them who he is correct who you are and, and maybe not through you through somebody else because yeah, of you exactly. i agree yes ma'am i was just going to say that that also i think he's showing us that for us to really know true love to love our neighbor we cannot know that without loving god I mean, 
because he is the essence of love. And that, of course, from a secular view, is totally foreign. Very totally much. Totally foreign. Jack. And uh, on the flip side of that, Nehemiah, whenever God told him to go build that wall, he didn't tell him to lay down his sword and his spear. He said, you better have your sword and your spear with you. So we as Christians, we've got to be very careful about all the love, 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 love. God don't expect us to lay down our sword and spear here. You, you, I don't know if anybody says love your enemies. He doesn't say he doesn't say don't defend me. Yeah, I think I agree with you, Jack. I just didn't think we have to we have to we have to examine who we're defending. So you're you you're right. Now if you interpret that piece of scripture, what God is saying to them is that these are not peaceful times. They're not peaceful times. As in, there is a certain sense of God was warning them that they're at a time of war, they're at a time of strife, they're at a time of... And, and although they were delivered, they were delivered back from Babylon, they were delivered back out of bondage for the second time, although we can argue that it wasn't really bondage, but they're delivered back to their land where they get to build their wall and build their temple again. They're still to do so under the knowledge that we do not live in times of peace. Now... You could argue the same thing today, Jack, I get that. But not from a physical aspect, as in no one's invading this country because we're Christians. Did that try to happen? Absolutely, it did. That happened in 2001, we get that. That we were attacked because of our Christian no nature and our Christian notion. But we are no longer in a time where there's, there's physical strife, there's spiritual strife, absolutely. But not physical strife, which is really what that story of Nehemiah is. That's, that's the, the best way to interpret that, is that it was a time of war, not a time of peace. Now, could you say that God gives you that warning? I think Jesus changed that because he knew. He says there was going to be persecution. Doesn't tell them to stay with the sword in hand then. In fact, complete opposite. A strong message, complete opposite. Paul says the same thing. James says the same thing. Peter says the same thing. He do, they all said the same thing, that actually... We now are in a time of peace. And one of, the, one of the most significant growths that I can see, when you look at the early church, and I said this to you many months ago now, it is biz, biz, bizarre to me that Tiberius wrote to Caesar and said, we have to stop killing Christians, it's just making more Christians. Right? Look what's happening in Iran right now. Now you guys may not know this. The Christian community in Iran is, is exploding. It's exploding. It's, you read, just, just Google it, read it up. The Christian, the, they are being persecuted, hung, crucified, and the Christian population in Iran is exploding. Who, who could think it? How can you actually think that? How can you come to any conclusion that this dominant Muslim country where the Ayatollahs are and came from, you have Christianity growing because the word of God, as Luke tells us in Acts, the word of God is all-powerful. Does that help? I know you disagree, but that's fine, you can disagree. But, but it's important to remember that the story of Nehemiah is an historical narrative of prophecy based on the timing as well. Well, again, you take God's word and you say, how does it fit in today's society? <coughs> that's the way I look at God's word. Correct. But you mustn't, ex mustn't dismiss the, the reason why it's written either. And if you remember from when I said this, we get to look at the law and the prophets from this side of the wall. Not this side. We, and that's important to remember. We view the law as Christians under the, under the banner of what? Which is, is a word I used for the last couple of weeks. There, the prophets and the law was under the banner of promise. We now stand under the banner of fulfillment. And we look back upon the prophets and the law based on the understanding of promise and fulfillment. And as we grasp that concept of promise and fulfillment, it changes the way you view it. Does it have a blackable notion today? Absolutely, and of course. But only under the guise of fulfillment. What is the fulfillment of the wall and Nehemiah's story of the sword? Is that we should be determined to defend what God asks us to build. But no longer with the sword. We now must do it with our hearts and aided by the Holy Spirit that came at Pentecost and using the word. All right, let's get into, let's continue.
But I don't want to miss with Jack's, because in 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High for he is kind and ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. With the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Questions, observations. That whole, that whole element, that whole element comes back to the most important piece sentence. And what is the most important sentence to really understand the word give, to understand the word fruitful, to understand the word joy. What is the key in sentence in that whole section of scripture? Yeah! Yes! 36. Be merciful even as your God is merciful to you. And actually, you guess what? Look at the talk on this side, right? You look, we get to stand here now with the fulfillment. And when you really take that apart, you really actually pull that apart, you put that ahead, you, you put that, and you turn around and you look at it, right? They didn't get this now. They're sitting and listening to Jesus say, be merciful as your God is merciful. Would they have understood that? Of course, yes, absolutely. It's a fairly simple statement to understand. God gives you mercies, therefore you give mercies to others, right? Jesus did that in the parable of the servant. Yes, the servant who owed the un unspeakable debt. The, un the unforgivable debt, he spoke about that in the parable. But here Jesus says, be merciful as God is merciful to you. And when you get that, you really understand that, every single beatitude falls into place. Forgive Bang. because we forgive. Correct. Okay. Not because you get something back. No. Forgive because no. you are forgiven. Right. Be merciful because you've been shown mercy. Give because you have been given something you can never pay back. Right? And Jesus is being really clear in this heart circumcision. He's talking about absolutely the keys to what it means to be a true Christian. Is that everything you understand in your life today has got nothing to do with you. It has got everything to do with the fact that your God was merciful. Amen. Okay, we have to finish early.